Now, if we look at the cell, then I mean, I just got, you know, like you would, I went to Wikipedia to get this. Uh, if we look at the cell, I don't know about you folks, but when I look at the cell, I say, oh my goodness, that sure as hell looks designed to me. I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be something which, you know, is just randomly put together. It doesn't seem to me like just a, 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 a pile of old junk, which as it were, was dumped out. That looks to me like something that somebody worked very, very hard to produce. So I don't want to deny, I don't want to deny that we're dealing with design-like phenomena. Now that's not part of what I'm saying tonight. I'm not saying that the design question is irrelevant or even false. Well, I'm, I'm obviously not going to say anything new at this point. So I just want to pull together what I've said before, because in a way, I'm, I'm seeing, you might say, why, why am I debating with somebody that I disagree so completely and utterly with? I mean, what's, what's the point of doing this? And I, I, I'm seeing that there is a great deal of point to doing this because I think it's bringing out some really important issues about the nature of science, about the, the way that we think. I agree with Dr. Rana that the problem of, that the origin of life is one hell of a difficult problem. I don't think anybody wants to deny that. I agree with Dr. Rana that scientists today do not have a full or even an adequate solution. I agree with Dr. Rana that there have been a lot of, shall we call them cowboys in this business, who have, you know, done a lot of speculating, what, as I say, Stephen Jay Gould used to call just so stories. They talk about it in sociobiology. You certainly see it here. So I, I don't want to disagree with any of those sorts of things. However, what I want to say is it's so instructive, isn't it? You've got what is a horrendously difficult problem. We've now got, don't forget, but at the same time, we've now, since the Watson Crick bottle, we've now started to get some tools that we can explore this. Uh, at first, it looked as though it was going to be easy peasy. But then within 10, 15, 20 years, it became clear that it was a lot more difficult than anybody thought a lot more difficult, and even today, I don't think anybody would want to deny that. So the question then is, where do you go from here? What, what's to be done? Do you throw up your hands? Do you take a biblical position? Now, as I say, if you're gonna take a biblical position and a biblical position, I can't stop you, but you're not doing science anymore. The question is, do you, at some level, have this, if I call it a hybrid, Dr. Rano will probably give me another word for it, but do you say, no, the science points me to miracles? And I want to say, no. I want to say no, because we are not coming to this problem, as it were, blank, without any experience, any more than coming to the Indian rope trick is blank without any experience. If I see the Indian rope trick or a boomerang, I don't immediately say, ah, Newton's laws don't work. I start to say, okay, what's going on here? Why does it look as though Newton's laws don't work? Because I know damn well they do. And I want to say exactly the same about the origin of life. It's a difficult problem. We've got some tools now. I think we are making some progress. We're not there yet. Probably we won't be there in my lifetime. I hope you'll be there in the lifetimes of some of you here, but perhaps not even them. But that's no reason to give up. That's no reason to give up the naturalistic approach. That's no reason to turn to miracles, not for religious reasons, but for scientific reasons. I want to say this is a paradigmatic example of a really tough problem where we've got some tools, an exciting, interesting, tough problem, and it's a paradigmatic example of why science doesn't give up, why science says we're not there yet, but let's keep trying because 
it's the answers are there. The problem is not with the it's, the problem is not with the problems. It's with our abilities to solve those problems. That, if you like, in Thomas Kuhn's language, these are puzzles, not problems. I don't think anybody is ever going to solve, what shall I say, the Palestinian question. I mean, I, give, give, I don't think anybody's gonna solve the American Senate problem. I think that that is a problem which is insoluble. I don't think there's any solution to that. It's not a puzzle, there's no solution. But I do think that the origin of life is a puzzle. I do think that there's a solution. And I want to say, let's get at it. And isn't that, isn't that exciting? And to, to, to quote Genesis, isn't that what being made in the image of God is all about? Trying to explore that wonderful world that he's given us with the abilities that he's given us. Thank you. Dr. Fuzrana, final comment, five minutes. Well, I think what you've heard tonight are two presentations. One you might say is a ruse, and one you might say was based on fuzzy logic. Um, I wish I could be as clever as you, Dr. Ruse. <laughs> anyway, that's my, my feeble attempt. Um, what I basically tried to do tonight is to argue that, again, the origin of life and the complexity of the cell require the work of intelligent agency in order to account uh, for, again, the emergence of life on Earth. And I've demonstrated or I attempted to demonstrate that every explanation for the origin of life through chemical evolution encounters significant problems, encounters dead ends. Many of these problems appear to be intractable. I've shown that when you look at the work in prebiotic chemistry, the role of intelligent agency cannot be ignored in making laboratory experiments successful that's, that appear to validate different stages in the origin of life process. And it's, it's because of the central importance of intelligent agency in these experiments that I've argued that again, the origin of life appears to be the work of a mind. Again, the, the, the work in synthetic biology, attempting to create life in the lab, leads us to a similar type of conclusion. I've also talked about the design in biochemical systems that, again, I think points us to the work of a mind. So you have four separate lines of argumentation that lead us to essentially the same conclusion. Now, uh, as I have been critical of work in the origin of life, I want to be clear that I do have tremendous amount of respect and admiration for the scientists that are engaged in this work. Uh, they are a breed of un, unto themselves who are, are people that are consumed with I believe to be one of the most difficult problems in science. So I have nothing but admiration and respect for them. And the more that I study the work in original life research, the more I appreciate again the ingenuity and the insight that these researchers have brought to this problem. But again, time and time again, uh, the ideas that have been proffered turn out to, to not withstand the rigors of scientific testing. I believe it is possible to develop a scientific model that employs the work of an intelligent agent, a creator. And one of the things we're doing at Reasons to Believe is developing a, a scientifically testable creation model where we attempt to take these ideas from the realm of reading through the creation accounts in Genesis into the scientific arena where we're willing to put our ideas uh, to, the, to the test, where we're, we're putting our ideas in harm's way. And, and I think the, our model actually performs rather well in the face of those types of challenges. At the end of the day, this is really very much a discussion about the nature of science itself. Is science about methodological naturalism, where only a certain category of explanations are allowed? Or is science first and foremost about a methodology that takes hypotheses, ideas, theories, models, and the predictions that emanates from them and applies scientific testing to those ideas and allowing the best models to, per to persist and discarding those models that are failed models? And so again, I think it's very much a question of the philosophy of science to some degree. And I, as a scientist, would like to think that science has the capacity to discover truth as opposed to 
science being a game that is played where we only are looking for natural process explanations. I think methodological naturalism actually makes science impotent to answer some of the most important questions, not only in science, but in mostly important questions to humanity at large. Uh, one of the critiques of our position, of course, are the bad designs found in nature, or presumably bad designs found in nature, and I believe it's possible to develop a robust response to that very, very much that legitimate criticism. So again, uh, at the end of the day, I believe that I have, have demonstrated and made my case that indeed intelligent agency is required for the origin of life. And as much as I respect Dr. Ruse, I'm not sure that he's convinced me that natural processes are sufficient. Uh, what I see him doing, and I see other origin of life researchers do this as well, is essentially appeal to the future. And this is essentially a logical fallacy because we need to evaluate this question with the data that we have at hand today. And that data that we have at hand today suggests intelligent agency is required to account for the origin of life.